Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. He's not supposed to mention the MySpace part. Um, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks to Pastor Rodney and uh, Pastor Jimmy for, for having me this morning. Excited to preach God's Word. Um, and uh, I've preached at Stonegate once before, a couple years ago, and was really encouraged then. Uh, it's cool to be in the new building. So my family, uh, we're praying with y'all that the Lord will use this for His glory and not just to have a cool space to be in, but a place for y'all to gather and, and to help people meet Jesus. So I want to pray, and then we'll get right into God's Word. Father, we come in Jesus' name, and we thank you for being so good to us, Lord. And we thank you for the gospel truth that we get to soak in, Lord. We, we pray that you'd work in our hearts, Father. It'll be a waste of our time if we only leave here with my opinions. God, we need to hear from you. That's why we open your word and read from it. So, Father, we pray that you would speak to us and that you'd be glorified. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I've, I've been asked uh, this morning to, to talk about uh, the gospel and race. And um, my plan is not to give us a uh, completely thorough, exhaustive look at that. I only have about 40 minutes, and I only plan to go about 10 minutes over that. So we don't have enough time <laughs> for me to give a perfect, exhaustive look at that topic. So what we'll do is we're going to look at a text in Ephesians. Uh, and we will look at how the gospel is celebrated there, what, what it's, the ways it speaks to people from different kinds of backgrounds, and we'll make some specific applications. And, um, and I told uh, the first service, too, but Pastor Rodney wasn't in here, so I need to say this again. I feel like Stonegate has a leg up on others um, because you have a white pastor named Rodney, and I've never met a white man named Rodney before, <laughs> and that is <laughs> racial reconciliation in the form of one man. So praise God for that. <laughs> uh, you can take that out of the podcast if you want to. Uh, I want to start just by asking you a question. Uh, have you ever felt like an outsider? In any season of your life, any particular place, have you ever felt like an outsider? Um, I bet you probably have, because all of us have, uh, depending on where that might be. And the interesting thing about being an outsider is it seems like all the good stuff is in there somewhere, but you're kind of kept on the outside. Uh, one example for me where I felt like an outsider is as a rapper, uh, because I'm a rapper and I talk about Jesus a lot in my music, which, uh, you know, makes me kind of unique. Hip-hop isn't usually known for morals and robust theology. That's not usually what people think when they think hip-hop, uh, which you can tell because all of y'all giggled because you knew. Um, and then... On the other side, too, even within Christian music, you know, being a rapper, people don't really know what to do with it. They're scared if, you know, they play my music on the radio, it will scare church mothers and uh, folks away. And so I just kind of feel like an outsider in all these worlds. And like there's good stuff that happens over here that I can't really quite get into because I don't quite fit into that. Not, not just hip hop. It could be in all different kind of areas where um, there are insiders and there are outsiders. And when you're an outsider, you, you're kept away from the benefits that the insiders get, right? So somebody who maybe has just come to our country, maybe, the, maybe that uh, thing that they're hoping to get could be citizenship. There are benefits there. If you're, if you're a student hoping to get into college, that thing you may be hoping to get might be that education. And until you get in, you're kind of this outsider. And it doesn't feel nice while you're on the outside, but it's something that all of us really naturally do, uh, where we kind of make these circles of insiders and outsiders, where we, where we find a group of people and we're like, those are my people. And those folks maybe aren't so much. It's something we do pretty naturally. And it doesn't always have to be malicious. Sometimes it's just convenient. So an example, when I was uh, in uh, high school, I went to a mostly white school, and all the black kids sat together at lunch. And we didn't, it just kind of happened that way. And so we would sit at lunch together, and we would freestyle, and then there would be scores of white tables, or they were talking about what happened on Friends, or whatever they did at their tables. <laughs> we were freestyling. And it wasn't malicious, it was just we had common interests, right? And uh, so we kind of hung together. And what I don't want to say is anytime you have common interests with somebody, it's wrong to enjoy them. But when that convenience of gravitating towards people who are like you turns into a rule, that's where it becomes a problem, where it begins to feel uncomfortable and inconvenient for you to ever include somebody in something that looks any different than you. That's, that's when it becomes a problem. 
Um, and, and one of the main problems is we can very easily drag that attitude into the life of the church, where we can begin to show up uh, together with God's people, and we can gravitate towards the people who look like us, who have the most obvious commonalities to us, and kind of stick with that, and kind of form this inside or outsider thing, even within the family of God. Somebody may say, well, Tripp, why is it wrong to love people who you have something in common with. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm saying you may have misunderstood who you have most in common with. Um, What thing is most significant that you may have in common with somebody? And here's what's at stake. If the church is no different than the world in terms of how people who are different relate to one another, then we may lie about This gospel, we we may give off the impression that the gospel isn't as transforming as we said it was. So I think that's what's at stake. And I think Ephesians 3 has something to say to us about that. Our brother already read verses 1 to 13. I will uh, read little bits and then I will talk about it. And I think the main point of this text for our purposes this morning is that the good news calls all of us to feast at the same table. If you leave with one thing, I want you to have that in mind, that the good news, the gospel of Jesus calls all of us to feast at the same table. So if you're wondering who can be invited into fellowship with God, into fellowship with us, the answer is anybody. God calls all of us to feast at the same table. And, and I want to look at that in, in three points. God, will, God can save anybody, God can use anybody, and God wants to show everybody. All right, so we'll start with that first one. Number one, that God will save anybody. And as a warning, the first point is the longest one. So don't get afraid midway through. Uh, when I get to the second point and you begin to fear and look for the exit. It, the first one is the longest. God will save anybody. Uh, whenever I do get a chance to read this text in Ephesians 3, it feels like a breath of fresh air because it feels so different than the world we live in, the air we normally breathe, which is very divisive, very polarized. And so to read a text where God is talking about welcoming all people uh, is refreshing. Um, I, I read an article recently, there was another reminder of this kind of inside or outside of thing that we do, about Serena Williams, and she, you know, is, you know, maybe the most dominant tennis player of all time. Tennis uh, is not a regular sport, it's like a country club sport, so it's not the most diverse of sports, and so she, shooting to the top of it is amazing, but even when she wins, she knows that those wins come with lots of offensive and racist comments. Right, so there's one time where she, you know, hit a ball and got the point, and somebody said, that's right, hit it like a Negro. So what they scream out to her is she's playing tennis, and there are all of these little subtle reminders, like even though you're dominant, you still don't really belong. You're still not really one of us. Right, and so that being the air that we kind of constantly breathe and live in, and some of us experience more than others, when I come to a text like this, where God is talking about the way that he's called all of us to feast at the same table, it feels refreshing. Not only because it talks about God's sovereign saving power, but the thing that that does to the people that he saves and how we interact with one another. So Paul, I'll read verse 1 again. Um, Paul says this. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and then he stops. It's almost like a light bulb goes off, and then he begins to go on a little bit of a tangent. So all of these 13 verses we're looking at right now are the tangent that Paul went on right here. Um, y'all got some friends who say something and they go off on a tangent for a while. That's what's happening in this text. I tend to do that. It annoys my wife, but I'm taking this text as affirmation from God that I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> so if my wife tries to say, stop going on all these tangents, I'm going to be like, well, God did it in Scripture, and you can't say nothing to that. So he goes on this tangent. The thing that, that makes him go on this tangent is he says he's a prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles. These Gentiles he's in prison for. And he says, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. He means, surely you've heard about this special task that God gave me, a special mission. And he's saying it's a mission for you, for those Gentiles. What does Paul mean when he says Gentiles? He basically just means non-Jews, those who are not of Israel, not descendants of Abraham, which is most of us in this room. And one of the reasons... Um, that that he brings that up is because in the Old Testament, God is, um, he decides to do his saving work and interact with uh, humanity primarily through this one nation, Israel. 
He doesn't have to be merciful to anybody, but he chooses Israel, and he gives his word to them very kindly, and he, he makes a covenant with them, and he goes before them in battle, and he makes these beautiful promises to them. And so God's saving work is primarily aimed at Israel. Um, and so Paul, being a Jew, is saying that God is starting to do something different, and that God has given him the special mission to go to the Gentiles with the good news about Jesus. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But, but I want to say this, that right here at the beginning of the text, Paul is a good example for us, that even though he's a Jew, he's saying he's in prison for the sake of serving Gentiles, and that God gave him that special mission, that God specifically wanted him to go to people who were different than him. And his way is very different than the insider outsider thing. Paul is not saying, I'm a Jew, and I want to be with my other insiders, and I want to keep you away from these benefits, even if it means you'll suffer. He's saying, no, 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 I'm going to make sure you can get in here and get these benefits, even if it means I suffer. Right, that I'm willing to be imprisoned. I'm willing to put my life on the line for even those who don't look like me because God sent me there on a special mission. Right, this is the countercultural nature of what Jesus has done for us. Right, that He's called us uh, not to keep people from benefits, but to suffer that they can get them. And I'll say this really quickly, um, just to be clear: we have different racial dynamics at play than what's going on in the text because we're talking about this nation of Israel who God worked with primarily, and Gentiles who was everybody else. But the principles we see here for what God wants his family to look like is plenty for us to apply. I'll keep reading verse 3. He says, That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This does sound super mysterious, what he's saying here. But he's not, when he's talking about this mystery, he's not talking about a murder mystery. You don't need to be looking for clues. All he's saying is there was something that God hadn't told, that God hadn't told his people in the past that he's begun to reveal now. That there was something about God's plan, about how he was saving, how he was doing his work, that he's now shown to us that he didn't used to know. And he tells us exactly what it is in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that, that right there is at the heart of this job God has given him, that God is no longer just working with Israel, that non-Jews can, can be saved without becoming Jews. And, and that should make us rejoice because most of us are non-Jews. That's part of what makes the good news good is that anybody can trust in Jesus. That's why I said God can save anybody. And that doesn't feel that surprising to us because we're used to thinking of God as... Um, uh, making this redemption available to everybody. But let me, let me just give you an example uh, so you can grasp how, how, how glorious this would seem to them. Imagine a super rich person like Bill Gates. And whenever we think of people and we like, hear about their net worth who was super billionaires, you know, what do you think? Probably a lot of us, the first thing is, man, can they just like give me a million dollars? Right? This is like me giving you a penny, a million dollars. You won't even miss it. Just someone steal a million dollars from them for me. They won't know. Uh, because they can give it easily. So let's say Bill Gates says, I want to give a million dollars to a bunch of people. And he said, I'm going to just pick a few neighborhoods, and your neighborhood doesn't get picked. You would be very sad. You'd say, he's really generous, but you'd be bitter. You'd go back to your sad life. But let's say the next year, Bill Gates says, you know what? I'm extending this to every, any and every neighborhood. You would do a praise dance, even if you can't dance. Because you would be so excited, and, and you would be like, man, he's so generous, and now I get to be included, and this is essentially what God has done. But now God is saying there are no boundaries, there are no dividing lines, there are no limits to where my saving grace can go. Absolutely anybody can be saved through what's happened in Jesus. And so Paul is rejoicing in the fact that he gets to be the minister chosen to take this gospel to the Gentiles. Anybody can be saved. So it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or Hispanic or Asian or Native American. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're somewhere in between. It doesn't matter if you're cool, nerdy, and you think you're cool. It doesn't matter if you're educated, if you're not educated, if you're able-bodied or not. Absolutely anybody can be saved, and that is good news. And that's at the heart of the good news of Jesus. That was God's plan all along, but now he's bringing it to pass. So one of the things this means for us is that we shouldn't assume that anybody is unreachable. Sometimes we interact with people who seem 
like they may be too far gone. They seem so determined to go away from Jesus. You're not sure if they could ever be saved. A text like this is a reminder that nobody is too far gone. If if you're here and you think you're too far gone, you can't be too far gone. Your sin may be great. No sin is greater than the grace of Jesus, right? No sin is more powerful than what Christ has done. So what that also means is, is that even local churches like Stonegate should try to do your best to not accidentally put up any walls or boundaries that would make people think Jesus only came to save folks like you. So, right, so we would never want to do anything that made it look like God is only interested in a particular kind of person. Right, so, so um, this means that we may have to examine our heart for any biases or prejudices. We may have to examine our hearts for any attitudes that we may give off. God wants to advertise this very all-inclusive message of the gospel, and we don't want to do anything to hinder that. Here's one thing that might mean for you. That might mean that when you come here to gather with with other believers, some who are like you, some who aren't, um, you know, there may be some days where they didn't do the song you wanted them to do, and that's okay. You know, sometimes you may be like, but where's how great is our God, though? But what a text like this is telling us is the gospel is not just for people who are like you. This gathering of believers is not just for people who like all the stuff that you like. That there needs to be the kind of posture that understands Jesus is trying to draw all men, all people to himself. And so everything doesn't have to be aimed at me because God wants to save people who are not like me. Uh, And that kind of humility and, and willingness to uh, to surrender, to serve, and, and build up one another is, is the kind of stuff that helps churches to be healthy and fruitful. And, and one of the glories of the new covenant is this, that nobody's unreachable. Everyone can be saved. Now, we'll say this. That there, there, there are some people who could agree with the statement that God will save anybody, even people from all nations, cultures, ethnicities, and will pat themselves on the back for having no prejudice in their heart, But haven't examined their hearts deeply enough. So an example of this would be um, racist evangelists of the past who would be happy for people to bring black people into a meeting to hear them preach the gospel, but would never in a million years have sat down with them for a meal. Now, what that may look like now is um, there, there may be some of us who the only interaction we ever have with anybody who doesn't look like us is when we're reaching down to serve them or to give them something they don't have. Well, some of us, maybe the only interaction we have with people who don't look like us is when we send some money every month to Compassion. And I want to encourage you in this way. You can still have a mindset where you put yourself above other people if the only way you're able to interact with them is when you're helping them, right? Worthy of your help but not worthy of your friendship or your time. And that can be a subtle way that we still undercut the dignity and value that God has put in every single person. I don't want you to let yourself off the hook just because you believe God can save anybody. Do you believe that God can put you in the same family to interact and love one another? So so I want to encourage you to build relationships with people. Spend time with people. And when we spend time with people, it helps us to understand one another and love one another. And here's what happens. He says he, he can save people from all different backgrounds. And it, we don't just, just remain just in our own separate corners. He says he makes us one. Look at verse 6 again. He says, the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So three things he says here. He says we're heirs together. We know what an heir is. An heir is someone who, who gets an inheritance from somebody. Right, so if someone has a, a rich family member who passes away, maybe they're in their will and they get to inherit it. Well, well God has called us his heirs, co-heirs with Jesus, that, that we inherit things from him. But with God, God doesn't have a will with a bunch of material possessions or some old watch or some old fa- family heirloom he's passing down. He has eternal spiritual blessings that he's pouring out on us. And then all of us are heirs together of what Jesus has to pass down to us. There aren't levels. There's not some heir that's better than others. Same level, we're heirs together. He says we're members of the same body. I cannot think of an image that points to more closeness than members of the same body, not just friends holding hands or people in the same room, members of the same body with the same head, the same mission, so that you're an arm and someone else is the other arm, someone else is the leg. 
right, that we need each other. We're part of the same body, as close as we could be. And then he says, share us together in the promise that everything that Jesus has promised to give his people, we share in together. He may be pointing specifically to the promised Holy Spirit he talked about in chapter 1. We have all of this that we share in together as part of the same body. We have so much in common. And one of the things I think we can look over sometimes when we have these conversations is that we do have more in common than we have different. That's what I mean when I say it's not wrong to love those you have the most in common with, but you may misunderstand who you have the most in common with. Not just people who look like you or who like the same music. Ephesians 4, he says a little bit, more. I'll, I'll read it quick. You don't have to turn there, but he says this. We need to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Do you hear all of that that we have in common? You don't have one faith and someone else has another one. You don't have one Lord and someone has another one. Or one baptism, we all have the same Ones, we will be spending an eternity worshiping the same Jesus. That is a lot more in common than just coming from a similar ancestry. To look in similarly, we have Jesus in common. So that means that we cannot elevate our differences with one another in a way that overshadows what we have in common. And, and this is, there are people that I'm friends with who I would never have been friends with without Jesus. Because we don't have nothing else in common. <laughs> Jimmy doesn't even know what basketball is. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Sometimes we don't have that much in common with folks, but we have Jesus in common. And, and that is a deep bond uh, that, that, that should draw us to one another. You're saved from your sins, too. You've been forgiven. The Lord is working in your life, too. That, that should produce something in us, a, a love for one another. You know, I have uh, you know, friends that are older dudes, and you know, I'm like, we would never hang out. Why? I'm like, why do older dudes always talk about the weather? I don't know, but we have Jesus in common. But, but here's what it also means. It, we, don't, we don't get to belittle our differences because we're one in Jesus. We don't get to say, let's just pretend none of our differences exist because we're one in Jesus. No male, no female, no slave, no free. I don't see nothing. I don't see color. I don't see your gender. I don't see nothing. We just believers. Let me tell you why that's not helpful. It's not real. It doesn't exist in reality. All right? So if I was talking to a single mom in the church and I was like, you know what? I don't even think of you as a single mom. You know, I just think of you as a, as, as, as a fellow heir in Christ. That may sound nice to me, but the reality is she's a single mom, which comes with a particular set of issues in her life. Right, there's a particular need she has, particular joy she has, right? We have to, we can't just ignore our differences. Same thing for racial differences. There's something that being a black man means for my life. So I had a brother one time be like, Trip, I don't even see you as black. I'm like, but I am. <laughs> and that means something for, for my life. So it doesn't mean we ignore our differences. Sometimes people say, whenever someone brings up race, they're like, that's racist. And it's like, no, it's, it's not. It's just like blaming a doctor for telling you you have cancer. He didn't give you cancer. He diagnosed it. So to point to issues that we have doesn't keep us from unity. Right? Having these conversations, race conversations don't hinder unity. What hinders unity is pretending this stuff isn't there because then we have a false unity, a fake unity. How can we bear one another's burdens if we ignore the particular burdens that we have? We can't. And I say all of this to point to the fact that unity is something that we have to work hard at. But the good news is this. We are not fighting to create that unity. That unity has already been accomplished for us in Jesus. You notice Paul says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're not creating this unity. We're just trying to cultivate it and guard it. God has already made us one in Jesus. He already did all the heavy lifting, as Jesus always does. And he's called us to work to maintain it, to cultivate it, to guard it. That unity takes work. There's no spiritual caste system. We all are heirs. We share Right, share us together in the promise, members of one body. There's no classes of believers. 
I watched a documentary on Scientology one time. I was obviously very bored, and I watched it. And, you know, you could, like, get up new spiritual levels by paying money. In my opinion, it was getting creepier the higher you got up, but people were paying to get to higher levels. That is nothing like uh, Christianity. There's no, like, higher VIP levels. What more could we want than being united with Jesus, forgiven of our sins, seen as righteous in his sight, eternal life? We're one with Jesus, no statuses in God's family. It's not like when you board a flight and you're zone 99 and all those people walk in front of you and judge you when you walk past them. We are all on the same level in Jesus. And this is part of why when we come into a building like this where believers are gathering, we, it's good to see faces that look different. Because this gospel call goes out to anybody, God will save anybody, and we want that to be on display. Number one, God, can, God will save anybody. Number two, God can use anybody. God can use anybody. Uh, whenever somebody unexpected does something great, it, it feels even more impressive. And Paul, in this text, is saying, I am not the dude you would expect to do this. I, I'm not the guy you would look to. First, this is what he says in verse 7. He says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul is saying he's been made a servant of the gospel and and that he's unexpected. And if you know anything about Paul's past, you know why he feels like the least worthy or the chief sinner. Because Paul, of course, was not always this dude trying to spread the gospel. He actually viciously opposed the gospel, approved the murder of people who wanted to spread the gospel. So Paul is not the one you would expect. First Timothy 1, he, he talks about being um, uh, the worst of all sinners and says God saved him to show people he can save terrible sinners. Almost like to woo us, like if I can save this dude, then surely you can believe that I could save you. And Paul is saying that God sent him to give this message of reconciliation, this glorious gospel. And I just want to remind you this, too, that God can use anybody. Whoever you were when you met Jesus, Jesus has made you someone new. I know some of those habits are still You're still working through. I know some of the sin and brokenness and consequences of stuff before is still there. But I want you to know Jesus has made you someone new. And so we shouldn't assume that God can't use us. Because what we know is that Paul is not the only one who's been given a task to take the gospel to people. That we've all been made ministers of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has given us that message and we get to take it to other people. We get to share in that joy. We can't use our shortcomings as an excuse. Verse 8, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me. Only A powerful God could use a man like that who hated him most to be the greatest missionary of all time. And if God can do that with Paul, what can he do with you? We are amazing with coming up excuses for why we are not good enough to do what Jesus has called us to do. And, and, you know, one of the, the glories of this is, okay, so we get to spread this message of reconciliation. God can save anybody and he can use anybody. That means that when, when Stonegate Church shares the gospel... Um, that you shouldn't just be sharing the gospel with people who look exactly like you. That means you should be sharing the gospel with people who don't look like you sometimes. So if one of the goals, you know, I've I've heard uh, Pastor Rodney and Pastor Jimmy talk about their desire for the church to continue to be diverse and grow in diversity and to look like uh, the growing community around here, and I think the Lord has given you all an opportunity for that. But but one of the things that happens is... um, one of the reasons churches don't grow in diversity is because members don't have diverse friendships. And so people try these little things like, Trip, which, you know, we want our church to be more diverse. And so we started singing some gospel songs, but it's the same. And I'm like, wh- wh- how do you think these black people that aren't at your church are going to hear the songs? You've, you don't know any black people. You think they're just going to walk by and hear gospel? Is that gospel? 
That's not how this works. It's also not going to happen just because Pastor Rodney has some genius magical evangelism plan. No, what happens is God has called the leaders to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and that's your work. So what happens is you got to have relationships with people who don't look like you that you invite to worship. you got to have people who don't look like you you share the gospel with. That's how this happens. And God has called you to do that. And if you feel like, I don't feel like I'm equipped to do that, let me remind you of Paul who God used to do incredible things for his glory because it's by his power. Nobody's impressed with the power of the hammer itself. The thing that drives the nail in is the power of the one who's holding it. We are God's tool. He's called us, preach the gospel. Let God, through his power, do the miraculous work. And, and when that happens, we get to show people the glory of what Jesus has done. I'll keep going. Verse 9, he says, Um, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. He's saying he gets to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Uh, Some of us would evangelize more if we remember that what we are proclaiming is the boundless riches of Christ. Sometimes we act like all we have to give people is bad news. The bad news is only there to let people know uh, their need for the good news. Uh, We act like we just got to drag people down when really we we say, no, we we are in desperate need of a Savior. We are sinners. We are deserving of judgment. But God has already done something about it. He sent Jesus. And the way that Paul is excited that God has included him in that, we too should be excited. That that this amazing plan that God has, he's included us in and he's called us... um, to use. Uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, speaking of other preachers, he says, they may preach the gospel better than I do, but they could not preach a better gospel. That's true of all of us. The good news does the work. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, we want you to know Jesus and want you to know that Jesus will save any of us. God will save anybody. God can use anybody. Number three, God wants to show everybody. God wants to show everybody. We we always have motivations for the things that we do. Somebody may ask you why you did something or other. In this passage, God tells us really clearly what his motivations are for what he did in Jesus. He, He says it super clear. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he's accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may say, Tripp, I thought you said it was really clear. Um, Because there's a lot of word manifold wisdom, rulers and authorities. And let me tell you, he's saying that the reason God did that, his intent was to show off how amazing his wisdom is. The reason he's revealing this mystery now that Gentiles can now be saved through Jesus as he wants to show off his amazing wisdom. It says his manifold wisdom, his multifaceted wisdom, that there's a lot of angles to how wise God is. May even be pointing to the fact that this church that he's saving for himself is multifaceted, lots of different kinds of people all into this one family. That's why God is doing that, to show off his glory. And it says he's doing it through the church. So this is not just something you just do individually. It has something to do with the family of God together. It has something to do with our unity in him together. And the craziest thing about this verse to me is who, in this verse, he's talking about making it known to, rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This is spiritual forces, probably those evil ones that oppose him. So that God really wants to taunt his enemies after he's defeated them. God is saying, look what I did in Jesus. Y'all tried and you failed. You probably thought you had him when he was dead, but third day he got up. This is like God's touchdown days where he's been victorious and he wants to celebrate it and taunt his enemies, which is uh, uh, boastful and arrogant when we're talking about human beings. But this is boastful and arrogant because we don't deserve all the glory and attention. But when God taunts his enemies, he does deserve all the glory and attention. And it's right for him to get all the glory and attention and for him to, to, to glory in his victory and to call us to join him in that. So... If if you don't get excited about helping the church to be a diverse display of what God has done in Jesus, it might be in part because you're not very excited about the glory of God. That doesn't excite you, unless you have a better way than God does to show off his glory. 
This is how God has said he's wanted to do it, through his church, showing off his wisdom in the life of the church together. He says, in Christ Jesus, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. I mean, this is what we have in Jesus. We have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Uh, It is mind-blowing that anybody could have boldness and confidence or access to the holy judge of the universe. This would be like a, a, a guilty serial killer who's obviously guilty standing before the judge who holds his fate in their hands and standing before him with boldness and confidence. Right, is that you'd expect they would have fear. And if the judge lets that person go, of course, that's it's unjust. That's, that's an injustice. But uh, there's something very different happening with Jesus. And the reason that we can approach him with boldness, approach God with boldness and access with confidence, it's not like the unjust judge who doesn't punish the crime. It's that God has already taken care of that punishment for us, that Jesus took the punishment for that crime while we can approach him with boldness and access with confidence. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus, you're not sure you know Jesus, there is nothing that I want more for you than to be confident about the state of your soul before God. And that is way more important than your job performance or your finances. When you stand before God and he knows all your thoughts and your actions, how confident will you be? We, we can go before him with boldness and confidence, and it has nothing to do with what we've done and everything to do with what Jesus did, that when Jesus died, he paid for sins, and he, he gave us his righteousness, and he rose from the grave, and he's cleansed us. That's the glorious message that God wants to go out to everybody. And God is going to use it to show everybody how wise he is, how glorious he is, how good he is. And if if you're hearing you are a believer, I want to encourage you not to be overly timid and fearful before God. We should fear God, but we should not, when we come before God, think that God only sees our sin or God... uh, uh, or that God doesn't really love us because we have been given boldness and access to God through Jesus, not through what we did, but through Jesus. Um, I'll say this, we, we, we live in such polarizing times that that truth that God has called all of us to feast at the same table just feels in stark contrast to what's around us, and everything is so polarized and so divisive that it just really just makes you want to back away from these conversations sometimes. It's just like, man, everyone is at each other's throats. Uh, And I understand that reaction, but I want to encourage you instead to see this not as hopeless, but instead to see this as an opportunity to show off the glory of Jesus. And that while everything else is crashing down around us and everything else gets more polarized and more divisive, that there are these communities of people who love Jesus, they seem to be moving in the opposite direction. Where instead of more divided, they seem to be more united. Where instead of more people looking the same, they seem uh, that more different people keep coming in in a way that makes people say, well, there must be something to this Jesus. And, and it will get tiring, right? There's some things that, that make us want to back away. Maybe it's fatigue from these conversations or just apathy, unawareness of the need for it, bad influences, impatience, all of that stuff. But I, I want to encourage you to press through. There's a few things I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to build actual relationships with people. Don't just read books about people that aren't like you. Read books if it's helpful. Spend time with people. Because it's when we spend time with people that we can see the nuances of of, of the differences in their life and to find ways to love them better. I remember a Chinese sister at a church where I was a pastor in D.C. um, who I didn't realize how difficult it was for her. She moved to the U.S. as a student to understand the sermon so that her and another group of, uh, of Chinese sisters would get together after church, right after, and listen to the sermon together just to try to make sure they understood it well. And that changed my understanding of what it meant for me to pastor her and to love her well. Wouldn't have happened if we didn't actually have an actual conversation. I want to encourage you to build actual relationships with people. Actually have people in your home. Parents, let your kids see people that don't look like you. Don't give your kids the idea that God only cares about one particular kind of person. I want to encourage you to be okay with awkward conversations. I'm going to just be awkwardly silent for a few seconds just to warm you up. (laughs) 
we cannot, we can, you cannot have any depth of relationship if you're overly afraid of awkward conversations. Let me tell you, I have had some extremely awkward conversations with people. One time this girl said to me, like, Trip, I passed the black dude on the way to work today, and he was so rude to me. He didn't even say hi. Why do, why do you think he did that? I was like, I, I don't know what he was doing. We don't have a black message board where we talk about our experiences. <laughs> I've never met this man. I don't know. That was very awkward, but the reason she said that is because I had given her the freedom, you know, just ask and we can work through it. And that gave me the opportunity to say, okay, I'm glad you said that to me. Never say that to anybody ever again. <laughs> and let's talk through that. But look, it, it not only takes the courage to, to ask tough questions, to have awkward conversations, it also takes the grace to believe the best about each other. It also takes Christ-like forgiveness to say, I don't think you should have said that that way. Let's talk through that. I don't like that assumption you made. Let's talk through that. But this is what it takes to actually have real unity, not a fake unity built on shallow surfacey stuff. Right? It's actually hard work. I want to encourage you to be patient. Um, and lastly, I, I want to encourage you not to always wait for other people to begin the conversation. Right? If you're one of those people who you'll talk about if you're forced into it, I want to encourage you to, to have those conversations intentionally with people. Um, and it is going to be hard. This unity is hard work, but I want to encourage you towards it. And here's why. Um, because Jesus has been such a good example for us in this. Jesus did not come to earth to save folks who were exactly like him, holy and spotless and pure. He came to save sinners. Jesus didn't come to earth where there was no conflict. Or there was no difficulty. Jesus came to earth for people who were separated from God. And Jesus dove right into that. Jesus didn't back it away from the conflict. He went forward and he laid his life down for people who were the offending party. So, so I want to encourage you to, to dive into these conversations. One, because Jesus is the example for us in that. And then two, Jesus died for a diverse bride. This is worth pursuing. This is how Jesus wants to show off his glory here. So again, you know, we could see this as a moment to back away or an opportunity to show the world what the power of Jesus looks like. We, we, we don't want to have that insider-outsider mentality within the family of God. The only insider-outsider is either we're in Christ or we're not. But when we're in Christ, we are all in Christ. And we are family and we are members of the same body and we want that to be reflected in the way that we live our lives. So my prayer for you, Stonegate Church is that the Lord would be with you, that he would be gracious to you, and that the godly goals that y'all have as a church uh, to honor Jesus in this way, that he would do it, he would honor himself, and that you get to look back and praise God for his work. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.